Welcome to this presentation. This um, is going to be our, I believe, seventh presentation relating to the Chapter 5, which covers pleadings. Uh, you'll find the PowerPoints that we'll be covering uh, from the second group of PowerPoints for the Chapter 5 presentation. Uh, let's go forward to uh, the slide that we were on at the conclusion. We've been talking in the last presentation about the format for the answer. And we've talked about the various parts of the answer. We talked about the caption. We talked about um, the admits and denies. We talked about affirmative defenses, um, a conditions precedent. Uh, we talked about um, the uh, subscription. We talked about the certificate of service. We even briefly talked about the verification. But let's talk about a different scenario. You know, we began this presentation about the responses to the answer presenting two options to the defendant. One was to file a, a motion, uh, excuse me, a Rule 12 motion. Another is to file an answer. And we talked about how sometimes those two functions can be combined, but usually you do one or you do the other first. Or again, you can combine them. I guess you could say that's a third option. If you do the Rule 12, you might at some later point uh, file an answer if, for example, your Rule 12 motion is denied or if it's granted and the person amends his, the, uh, the plaintiff amends the answer to correct the problem, then you'd go ahead, of course, and file an answer. Um, occasionally, you might file an answer and then follow up with a a Rule 12 motion if that issue is still valid, for example, an objection to subject matter jurisdiction, for example. But let's consider a fourth possibility. In this scenario, you haven't filed an answer. You haven't filed a Rule 12 motion. You haven't done some kind of hybrid document. You filed nothing at all. And in fact, over 21 days have passed. You have now defaulted in theory. And that's what we're going to talk about. What happens when a defendant fails to file an answer or any other response? Well, we call that a default. A default is not a happy thing. It's rare that a defendant intentionally defaults. Um, there's no strategic advantage for defaulting. Now, I will tell you that if you really are judgment proof, if you don't have money and you can't afford an attorney, well, you don't really typically have a lot at stake in a federal court, civil court at least, um, by just ignoring the lawsuit because I've, after all, you can't get blood out of a turnip. So uh, are there times that a person can rationally decide, you know what, I'm just going to default? Um, but that's not the usual situation. Usually when defaults happen, it's because of, a, of an oversight of some type. So what is the default? Well, it's the failure of a party. We're talking, of course, here about the defendant to respond to another party's pleading in which a response is required. Okay, so we can't have a plaintiff default by not filing his complaint, right? Because he's not required to respond to another party's pleading under those circumstances, right? So it's when you are in the role of the defendant, um, whether it's 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 a. Uh, uh, in, in the initial complaint or in the counter complaint situation, you need to respond to that uh, pleading. You're required to respond, and if you don't, you default. So keep in mind that um, it's the role of the defendant who can default. So if the defendant defaults, what is the plaintiff going to do? Well, the plaintiff sees this typically as wonderful news. Oh my gosh. I was expecting to have to litigate this case, and it looks like maybe I won't have to after all. So good news. One of these circumstances, you're going to request a default judgment. So the person has defaulted, the defendant has defaulted, now we need a default judgment to be entered. What is it? Well, as you can see, first of all, it's a judgment, and again, notice 1E in judgment. So it's a judgment entered against the defendant who fails to appear. In this situation, we mean respond. We don't mean, you know, he's got a magic cloak that makes him invisible or something like that. And defend against the lawsuit after having been given proper notice of the lawsuit. In other words, he's been properly served. 
So how do you go about doing that if you're the plaintiff? How do you take advantage of this really good break? Well, the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to file with the court an affidavit verifying that the opposing counsel had defaulted. And you are going to request that the clerk enter the party's default in its records. And this is called no big surprise here, an entry of default. And it's what the court clerk does, noting, hey, you know what? We got the return of service on, cert on X date, and we've counted up the dates, 21 days from then, and hey, no answer. Um, and so that would be the entry of default that the court clerk would make. So that's step one. And now we have step two. Based upon that entry of default, now the plaintiff applies for a default judgment. Um, that's usually a pretty easy step. The court sees that there's an entry of default, so of course there's going to be a default judgment. But it's not smooth sailing completely for the plaintiff because the plaintiff is still going to have to prove his damages. Um, and so uh, typically what's going to happen is that there's going to be a brief court hearing. Now, obviously, the defendant's not going to be present. So the plaintiff has a pretty easy right of this where he's going to be presenting testimony to prove up his damages. Since there's not going to be any counter testimony or any cross-examination, it's a pretty easy process. That doesn't mean, of course, that the court might not ask questions uh, to confirm, hey, now what happened here? Or why would you say that? Or how about this counter argument or something like that? Many times there'll be a hearing, but it's also possible that you can use affidavits depending upon the preferences of that particular judge. So that's um, how the plaintiff gets the judgment entered. And then, of course, the plaintiff has to um, enforce that judgment, which, you know, typically against a defaulting a defendant isn't always the easiest thing to have happen, especially if the defendant defaulted because he didn't have any money. Okay, but let's imagine you're the defendant. You know, you what? You know what? You were asleep at the wheel, or somebody in your organization was asleep at the wheel, and you didn't file your answer as you were supposed to. Um, uh, probably, you're not going to just wake up and say two or three days later, "Oh my gosh, we forgot to file our answer." Most likely, you're going to find out about that when um, uh, the plaintiff is trying to execute on its judgment, and so. Um, what, what options do you have? Well, you have some. You don't have the best options. Um, you, what you may want to do is file a motion to set aside the default judgment. And here we're going to be looking at Rule 60. A defendant must file the motion within a reasonable time after the judgment is entered, but in no event later than one year. So there is a time period associated with that. Why or, or how or what's likely to happen or what's likely to be the, the fact scenario? Well, usually it's going to be we forgot, we didn't, uh, somebody in our organization was served and didn't realize what it was and oh, we're so, 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 so sorry, we didn't mean to mess, mess up here. Um, and that, now the court will have to make a decision. Are we going to set it aside or not? And it's really left up to the court to decide um, whether that's going to happen or not. And there's not a lot of uh, other factors that are considered. It's just what the court thinks is reasonable under the circumstances. So let's go to this Rule 60 so we can see what's going on here. Relief from a judgment order. Let's just click on this and see what we've got here. Grounds for relief from a final judgment order proceeding. On motion and just terms, the court may relieve a party of its legal or its legal representative from a final judgment order or proceedings on the following reasons. Mistake, inadvertent surprise, or excusable neglect. That's the one that we're going to be using for the purposes of setting aside a default judgment, most likely. Just because some of those things exist does not necessarily mean the court is going to grant relief, but it's a possibility. Okay, so let's consider the situation where you filed your answer by the deadline, but uh, time has passed and you realize, you know what, um, maybe there were some things in the statement that are in our initial answer that we want to change. Well, the naming convention is the same for the answer as it is for the complaint. The first time we amend the answer, we call it, you know, of course, our original answer was defendant's original answer. And our second answer, our second, when we decide to replace our first answer, we're going to call our second answer defendant's first amended answer. And when we want to replace defendant's first amended answer, we're going to call it defendant's sec second amended answer. 
So that's again that same uh, system that we had when we were talking about complaints. Okay, so let's talk about um, when you can go ahead and, and make those changes. And it's the same uh, time scheme that we talked about when we were talking about complaints. Um, we've already talked about the deadline for filing the answer initially, and we said it's 21 days after being served. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so it's, I'm sorry, I, I should have been more carefully. This is, once you file your answer, then you have 21 days after serving the answer on the plaintiff to file an amendment. So if you file, let's say you file your initial answer on the 21st day, well, then you have 21 more days to amend as a matter of right. You don't have to ask anyone's permission. So in a way, you have 42 days to get it right before you have to get anybody else involved. But let's say you're beyond that time frame. Well then, of course, you can, just like the plaintiff can get the defendant's written consent, um, the defendant can get the plaintiff's written consent. And alternatively, if that's not going to work, you can file a motion to the court. And the court, again, is going to freely grant this leave when justice so requires. And this is the same rule we saw when we were talking about amending the complaint. So you can see it's a, it's a matching system. So let's look at claims for affirmative relief. We already saw this in the um, Little Caesars answer that we covered in the last lecture, wherein we saw that there was an answer, but there was also something else. I skipped over it quickly. We haven't actually looked at it yet, but we're going to talk about the wonderful world of counterclaims, cross-claims, and third-party complaints and see how those work. Um, so let's get started. So what is a counterclaim? Well, here's a definition. A counterclaim is a complaint filed by a defendant. Hmm, that's interesting. We think about the plaintiff filing complaints, but now we're talking about the defendant filing a complaint. And this is when the defendant is now assuming the role of the plaintiff. And now, of course, if the defendant is assuming the role of the plaintiff, the plaintiff must be assuming the role of the defendant. So in the initial lawsuit, the plaintiff was suing the defendant. In the counterclaim, the defendant, who is now called the counter plaintiff, same person, but different name, is now suing the person we used to call the plaintiff, but now we're calling him the counter defendant. So these are the same people. And depending upon what part of the lawsuit we're looking at at any particular time, we would use one term or not. So when we're talking about the allegations in the complaint, we're going to use the red terminologies. When we're talking about the allegations in the counterclaim, we're going to use these blue terms. It can get confusing, no doubt about it. Okay, uh, typically the um, counterclaim is going to be found in the answer. Uh, usually it's after you've actually gotten through all the answer parts where you've responded, admit, deny, etc. And then you're going to have a section called the counterclaim. And um, again, we've already talked about the designation, counter plaintiff, counter defendant. Um, you still have to follow whatever the statute of limitations is for that particular uh, set of cause of action. Of course, it can be multiple cause of actions. It doesn't have to be just one, but all those are listed in the counterclaim. The counter defendant must file a reply to the counterclaim because after all, it's a, it's a, um, a, a complaint essentially. So the counter defendant who is also the plaintiff, right, in the main or the first lawsuit, if he doesn't file a response to the counterclaim, then he um, is the one who's going to default, right? So uh, that's the, the time you may recall earlier. Let me just flip back here for a second. You may recall earlier, you may have been a little bit surprised by this lingo here, where we had default is a failure of a party. Remember I put defendant here? You may have thought, well, Groover, why didn't you just put defendant originally? Well, because it can be the plaintiff can be the person who is the counter defendant, who is also the plaintiff, because it can be the pleading that has to be responded to can be a counterclaim or a cross-claim. Um, so that was why the lingo was a little bit cagey there. 
we usually just use the term defendant because in a way the counter defendant is the defendant but uh, since uh, that person also has the name plaintiff it can get confusing okay let's consider two universes of counterclaims one is a compulsory counterclaim and of course you can tell by the word compulsory you gotta file it now that term's a little bit misleading you actually i don't think ever have to sue somebody when we say counter compulsory counterclaim what we mean is if you're ever going to be able to sue the person you have to sue them now you can always elect not to sue them at all um, so it's not compulsory in the sense you have to sue somebody um, and that would be and here are the four conditions and we'll look at this rule in a second the claim meaning the counterclaim must already exist by the time the defendant is required to respond to the plaintiff's claim obviously you can't sue it something that hasn't happened yet so it wouldn't be a compulsory counterclaim if it hasn't happened yet and you can see these are all four requirements so we can think of this as and I'm just going to add the and here so it's clear so we've already, the, the first one kind of makes logical sense the second one is the claim must arise out of the same transaction so if um, Bob and Louise have a uh, a complicated life together and several different issues you know there was the car accident then there was the loan then there was the defamation lots of different things going on in their relationship um, then you, you know you, you might be able to have lots of separate lawsuits but if it's all if you know Louise is saying Bob caused the car accident in which she was injured and Bob's saying no no it was Lisa who caused the car accident that I was injured in and it's the same car accident well guess what whoever sues first the other person has to sue has to counter sue in that same lawsuit so you can see how there can be a rush to the court because when you are the plaintiff uh, you always are thinking or at least you should be thinking at least to some extent hey you know what I might also become the defendant I might become the counter defendant and so I might want to be sure to sue earlier rather than later so that I can pick the court that I think is advantageous to me either because it's more convenient for me or more convenient for my attorney or because I think it's gonna uh, have a, a judge or a uh, uh, rules of civil procedure or a jury pool that's going to be more advantageous to me okay so that's the second thing we need to have let's look at the third thing the claim must not require adding another party over which the court cannot acquire jurisdiction we've seen this in the past in chapter four obviously if you'd have to add somebody that the court can't acquire jurisdiction over that's a big problem and so and then finally the defendant's claim must not be subject of another pending action obviously if the defendant has already filed a second or another lawsuit somewhere else probably this lawsuit is invalid because probably that was a compulsory counterclaim to the defendant's previously filed lawsuit this is the main thing though this is the one that that's a main uh, requirement uh, for the purposes of, of the matter so if it isn't out of the same transaction it's not a compulsory counterclaim it's a permissive counterclaim right um, and of course as you can tell by the name you are permitted as the defendant to file a counterclaim but you don't have to if you want to you can file a separate lawsuit and again the main thing here is it does not arise out of the same claim so here is an example of how you might title this particular lawsuit so you have your lovely caption the caption is going to be the same as it is in the complaint and you're going to call it defendants original answer so we see the three parts name of the party how many has, of these documents have been prepared what is the name of the document answer and counterclaim you don't want to just say answer if you're also including a counterclaim in it similarly you don't want to just say counterclaim if you're also answering the lawsuit and as I say it's a matter of, of tradition that you put the counterclaim under the answer um, I don't think there's probably a, a actual rule about that but this is definitely how it's done so that's probably how you ought to proceed and then you're going to have a section again um, it can be multiple counterclaims it doesn't have to be one necessarily okay let's consider cross claim so the cross claim is similar to a counterclaim but instead of turning the plaintiff into a defendant you're turning your um, uh, co-defendant into your defendant so here we have uh, again a triangle the plaintiff is suing defendant a and defendant b and now defendant a or defendant one i guess has chosen to cross claim uh, defendant two 
So now defendant two is being sued by both the plaintiff and defendant one. And again, usually the, the cross claim is going to be filed in the answer, um, and it's going to be entitled cross claim. And you can see the names we have: cross plaintiff and cross defendant. So pretty uh, similar names. Basically, wherever we were talking before about counter, we just put the word cross in instead. Um, and so, what are the things about a cross claim? This one, it must be based on the subject matter. So, uh, before we were talking about permissive and compulsory. For a cross claim, it has to fit into that compulsory category. So, if, if for, uh, for unrelated reasons to plaintiff, um, defendant one and defendant two have a beef, this isn't the, the venue for this. Defendant one should sue defendant two in a separate lawsuit. It's only when this whole transaction here uh, in the opinion of defendant one has resulted in him having a claim against defendant two. A lot of times it's going to be an indemnification matter. Uh, let's see if there's anything else we need to talk about here. Yes, this is the, the idea of indemnification right here. The, the cross defendants must file a response. So again, we can have a default if the, 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 a second answer isn't filed. Uh, no cross claims are compulsory. And again, here is an example. We see the same name where we, where we had counterclaim before. Now we have cross claim. And of course, we're likely to put it underneath the answer. Okay, now third party complaints are a really different thing. So um, uh, uh, counterclaims and cross claims are more similar to each other. Third party complaint, we're going to be adding some things uh, to, to this that are make it a little bit more complicated. So, what is a third party? Well, a third party is a stranger to the lawsuit. Now, I don't mean a stranger in the sense of the third party doesn't know the plaintiff or the defendants. Most likely, the third party does know the plaintiffs and defendants, but I mean a legal stranger. He is not yet a party to the lawsuit, he is not listed in the caption of the case. So this is when the defendant says, you know what, plaintiff, you're suing me, but really it's this other guy or woman in this case who ought to really be sued, someone you didn't even think to sue. And so we're going to bring in this third party, this stranger, at least to the style of the case. And this is going to be uh, Federal Civil Procedure 14. Um, let's go ahead and look at that rule for a second. Oh, actually, well, let's go back and look at Rule 13. I didn't really show these rules. Here you'll find the rules about a compulsory counterclaim, a permissive counterclaim, and we have a cross-claim against a co-party. Um, so you can see the, the ins and outs are established here in Rule 13. Let's go to Rule 14, though. That's a third-party practice one. When a defending party may bring in a third party, a defending party may as third party plaintiff, service summons and complaint. Ah, you can see here, because this is a third party that we're bringing in, um, this party has never been served with any lawsuit, hasn't received a summons yet. So it's a lot more complicated matter to third party complaint somebody than it is to counterclaim and cross claim. Because in, in the counterclaim and cross claim situation, the party either wrote the initial complaint or was served with the initial complaint. And so there's really a, no need to serve anything other than just a normal certificate of service to get that person in the game. But this one, in this situation, the defendant who is third partying another party uh, not in the pub, in the party, but a third party, bringing him into the lawsuit, you're going to have to really take on the role of the plaintiff in terms of getting the summons, getting it served, and all that good stuff. So let's go back say, a defending party may, as a third party plaintiff, serve a summons and complaint on a non-party who is or may be liable for it for all or part of the claim against it. So again, the focus of what the, the defending party is doing is saying, I'm not responsible to you, plaintiff. This non-party, this third party is the one who's responsible. But the third party plaintiff must by motion obtain the court's leave if it files a third party complaint more than 14 days after serving its original answer. So there's a 14 day period which you can do that. After that, you have to get leave of court. 
The third party defendant, this is the stranger to the lawsuit who's being brought in, the third party defendant, his claims or defenses. The party served with the summons and third party complaint must assert any defense against the third party claims under Rule 12, must assert any counterclaim against a third party plaintiff. Third party plaintiff is the defendant who is suing him under Rule 13a and may assert any counterclaim against the third party plaintiff under 13b or any cross claim against any other, against another third party defendant under this rule. You can see things get complicated really, really fast. Plaintiff's claims against a third party defendant. The plaintiff may assert against a third party defendant any claim arising out of the transaction occurrence as a subject matter of the plaintiff's claims against the third party plaintiff. So the third the, the plaintiff, the person, you know, the person who initially filed the lawsuit can also get in on this action. So you can see um, now we have here, when can a plaintiff bring in a third party? When a claim is asserted against a plaintiff, so this is when we have a counterclaim, the plaintiff may bring in a third party if this rule would allow a defendant to do so. So um, things can get, as you can see, pretty complicated pretty fast when we're talking about um, third party practice. What is the purpose of a third party complaint? Let me go ahead and go back here. It is to bring to the lawsuit new parties who may be liable for some or all of the judgments the plaintiff may attain against the defendant. I should have appeared here, I apologize. And these oftentimes are indemnification or contribution. What is indemnification? Oftentimes this is by contract. Uh, imagine for a second that I sell lawnmowers in my hardware store. Um, you come into the store, you buy one of the lawnmowers, you take it home, and guess what? You start it up and the blade comes off, you're badly injured. Uh, you sue me. You probably also sue the manufacturer, so you have two defendants, me and we'll say Toro. Well, I'm probably going to cross-claim Toro because my contract with Toro probably has an indemnification procedure. Because Toro, will, um, in my contract with Toro, Toro will say, you know what, uh, we're the ones who actually put together the lawnmowers. And, um, you know, you're not going to want to carry our lawnmowers if, we're, if you're going to have to pay for any harm that happens when the lawnmowers injure somebody. And after all, really, you're not experts about how to manufacture lawnmowers. You're not experts in how to uh, inspect them to make sure that they have all the parts in all the right places, all the bolts are screwed just the way they ought to be. And so it makes sense in that situation for Toro's uh, contract with me to include identification procedures. But of course, the plaintiff doesn't care about that separate contract. He didn't sign that contract, so he's going to want to sue me. Maybe I'm the deep pocket. Maybe I'm Walmart, for example. And he's also likely to want to sue Toro because maybe Toro's the deep, deep pocket. Um, and so, you know, why not sue more rather than less is usually the philosophy of plaintiffs. But um, Walmart or me, uh, we're going to have this indemnification clause in our contract, and so we're going to sue Toro. So that would be an example of a cross claim. And again, if it's a con, it's an indemnification contract, probably the indemnification will be complete. So if the uh, plaintiff is successful in his lawsuit against me and gets a big judgment against me, I can just. Uh, say to Toro, okay, Toro, you need to pay this. And um, Toro will have to pay it, assuming that Toro has the sufficient assets to pay it. Now, if for some reason Toro goes bankrupt, um, then me vis-a-vis -vis the plaintiff, I'm going to have to pay it. Um, and I can always try to collect against Toro, you know, with Toro. Contribution is a partial payment. Um, imagine for a second that instead of me being the um, uh, the retailer of the lawnmower, I'm actually Toro, but some of the components that we use in our lawnmowers we buy from other companies, the bolts, the blades, and, and our job really is to assemble them. Well, we bought some blades from a supplier and uh, some of the blades didn't function exactly right and um, they contributed to the accident. But guess what? Also, our installation procedures weren't the best and so part of the blame for it is ours, part of the blame for it is the blade manufacturer. Well, let's say the, the plaintiff didn't sue the blade manufacturer, just sue Toro. Well, you can see how we would want to, in those situations, third-party complaint the blade manufacturer in. Um, 
we're not probably going to have an indemnification situation because, yeah, we messed up too, but we're going to seek at least contribution under those circumstances. So that's how it might work out. So a third-party complaint is different than the counterclaim and the cross-claim because this is going to be a separate document. It is not going to be just a part of the answer. And we're going to have to have the service of process or the waiver, just as we would if this were the first lawsuit that's being filed in this action. And again, we're going to have the process of filing a third-party complaint. Uh, interpleader is a common term for that. Oops, wait a second. Let me go to the next slide. Okay, so again, we have our names. We've already seen them at this point. We have the third-party plaintiff, which is the defendant in, the, for, in the, the, the initial lawsuit. And then we have the party that we're bringing in, and that party is going to be the third-party defendant. We already saw the deadline 14 days after the original defendant filed its original answer. Um, that's how long the original defendant has to third-party somebody in. The third party defendant must respond to the complaint. Again, it's an answer just like any other answer. And now look at this. We're, we're changing that comment. Forget that comment right there. We're changing the caption. You may recall when we were talking earlier, I said the caption never changes. Well, I lied. This is a scenario in which the caption does change. And you can see. Up, everything that's in black was the way the caption was initially. The stuff in red is what was added when Bert D. Bandit decided to, I don't think that L should be in there, Wilhelmina Justice in as a third party defendant. Um, and so we've added another V. So we have v, uh, Justice V. Bandit V. Justice. And you can see this is our title. Um, they did not put in original. I guess that would have been better. The case number remains the same. Now, when you actually file it, obviously you're not going to have this in red. You're going to have it in black as you ordinarily would. So this is the time that the caption changes. Now, going forward, you're going to use this expanded caption forever and ever. That's not going to... So this becomes the new caption for the case. E, that's the caption that even Buford T. Justice would be using. Um, so I'm going to close this. Down. I'm going to show you another uh, slide uh, that I think is helpful. This is a picture of all the different relationships that we have with complaints, cross claims, and counter claims, and third party complaints. I like, uh, to me, this kind of puts it all together. If this is confusing and overwhelming, please ignore it. It's only, if it adds value, awesome. If it doesn't, not. But let's just walk through it. So we start with the plaintiff. The plaintiff is the first person who files a lawsuit. And he is suing defendant A and defendant B. So these red lines coming down is the initial lawsuit. And you can see we're calling that document the complaint. It's the same complaint. Both of these people are sued in the same complaint. Well, defendant A decides to counterclaim plaintiff. So we have this red line going up, and this will likely be in defendant A's answer, he will include a counterclaim again against the plaintiff. Well, defendant B does the same thing in his answer to plaintiff's lawsuit, he includes a counterclaim against the plaintiff. So we have one complaint, two counterclaims, and now we're going to see, oh, defendant A wants to cross-claim defendant B. Well, that will also be in the answer. So defendant A's answer will have a traditional answer, again, focused on responding to the complaint, have a counterclaim against plaintiff, and then we'll have a cross-claim against defendant B. And that's where you have this line here. So um, defendant A is really just, even though there's three things he's accomplishing and he's, he's filing, it's just going to be one document. It's going to be a answer slash counterclaim slash cross-claim. Defendant B will do the same thing. In his answer, he has this counterclaim against a plaintiff. He has his answer to plaintiff's complaint. And he has this cross-claim that he has against defendant A. But guess what? Defendant B files a third-party complaint against this third party. 
um, this is going to be a separate document, not part of the answer slash cross claim slash counterclaim. Also, defendant A might have a third party complaint, possibly against the same third party, possibly against another third party. This would not likely be the same document. I suppose it could, but more likely they would file them separately. So you can see how it can become a very complicated um, situation. I'm going to post this so you'll have access to this particular slide. Again, if you find it useful to have all of the, the parts together, awesome. If you look at this and think that this makes my brain hurt, uh, then, then think about each one separately. Either way is fine. I hope this presentation, these, these series of presentations have been helpful for you in understanding Chapter 5. If you have any questions about Chapter 5, about the pleadings section of this course, please come to either my office hours or class time to ask. I'll be delighted to go into more detail or more explanation about any point that we've covered. Again, thank you for your attention and have a wonderful um, day.